Well, thank you everyone for joining us for another Q&A session, uh, ICMI 21. Today we're talking about parental alienation, and I believe we might also be chatting a bit about coercive control. Today we have Natalie, my co-host, who everybody knows. We've been seeing her a lot uh, this week. Uh, can I get, Amanda, can I get you to introduce yourself, please? Hi, uh, thank you for having me. It's Amanda from the Eeny Meeny Miney Mo Foundation. Um, I have generational lived experience in parental alienation. So that's pretty much how I came about finding or founding the organisation. And um, Not, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I, I'm not a man from, not a man. <laughs> um, and I am currently going through lived experience of parental alienation, um, battling continually to have contact and relationship with my three kids uh, mm -hmm. and facing a number of challenges there. Um, yep, yeah, so that's me. Thank you. Now, not I don't think you've explained how you came to have this this uh, name. Uh, I think you've, you've told us it, uh, offline, but I don't know if you've ever said it online. No, at least in ICMI twenty one. Uh, would you be happy to briefly explain how you came to have this name? Certainly. My um, my wife at the time um, had drunk a little bit too much and said uh, repeatedly, "You're not a man. You're not a man. You're not a man." So um, so I figured that. Uh, just as many good people do, they will repossess an insult and turn it into a, into a war cry. So that's what I did. Uh, I said, okay, then if I'm not a man, then I'm not a man. And uh, here I am publicly um, as an activist trying to stop this sort of, this sort of rubbish. So yeah, you emb embraced it and owned it. Yes. Um, it also, it was necessary to have an alias because um, claiming to be a victim of domestic violence publicly and running for the Australian Senate uh, meant that uh, by claiming to be a DV victim, somehow police considered that that meant that I was claiming that somebody else was a perpetrator, which is a breach of a DVO because I'm criticizing them using social media so therefore I could get criminally charged for saying that I'm a DV victim so I used an alias yeah what a world we live in ah, yes. the, we've got a question already from Douglas Wallace mm -hmm. uh, my efforts to have parental alienation recognized internationally and in my country have been countered by the feminists at every at every time which I know doesn't surprise you Part of this is because Marx had his own theories on alienation. Would it help to be more flexible in what we call it, such as calling it child estrangement, domestic coercion, or family severance? I guess you can call it emotional abuse, emotional and psychological abuse. And rather than using the actual term is, is paint the picture, you know, the, the behaviors in the child, um, that you once had a positive relationship with the children, um, the alienating tactics that are being used, um, we have quite an extensive list on uh, the eTripleM.org.au website where you can actually look, it actually comes from the book um, uh, by my colleague, Dr. Mandy Mathewson and, and um, I'm just trying to think that, um, Marcus Turnbull and, hang on, I'm just thinking, Janet Haynes, so I had a bit of a blank there. <laughs> it's, um, it's from the book, so it's, um, it's a little bit more extensive than some of the lists that you'll actually find online. Um, you've got the Amy Baker um, website, which you can find quite a lot of work on there, but this one just goes a little bit more into, you know, what it actually looks like. And that's often the best way is to actually, rather than using the term, is actually, yeah, painting the picture and getting the research under their noses. Uh, not, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, probably more of a more of a political response to that, which is that if we if we use a jargon term, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, it doesn't matter whether we call it parental alienation or or any other term. That term will become the target of attack. Um, so in a way, it's it's quite arbitrary. If if we traded that name for a different name. 
then it would end up being in exactly the same position because the name will be attacked, mm -hmm. subject to misinformation. Um, so I, I do certainly think it's useful to avoid using a label um, and describing the behavior as Amanda says. Um, the, and, and that successfully sidesteps the, the accusation that, oh no, this term doesn't exist, it's junk science, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, hang on, this behavior as described is obviously possible to be done. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> And as you say, oh, sorry, go on, Amanda. Yep. I was just going to say, you know, with our, with our petition, we refer to as parental alienating behaviours, you mm -hmm. know, so you you can go to the list and it's pretty much like ticking boxes and parental alienation is the outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, some people um, often use the term saying, oh, um, I'm experiencing parental alienation and yet they might see their children like, you know, every other weekend, but they're referring to the term, um, which makes it very difficult for the... the um, even though contact denial is an alienating tactic, but it's not parental alienation in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And that's where it, it often just gets, yeah, it gets quite loosely used, um, which is unfortunate. And so that's why we sort of, I started down that pathway to actually educate people um, publicly about what it is, um, what the profile of the alienating parent looks like um, and what tactics they use and the outcomes and the, and the long-term harm it causes children as well as um, parents. You know, that's right. Yeah. That's right, go on, I mean, yeah, no. I just want to say we're picking up so many of these dynamics in our studies that we're doing with the University of Tasmania. There's some devastating outcomes for kids and parents. That's actually a really good point about, about uh, using the terminology there. And in actual fact, I'm going to go through now and look at our stuff and see if uh, see that we're using that appropriately. I think that's uh, that's a very important point. And, I, and uh, I'll, look, I'll look at Wiki for Men and a Voice for Men and so forth and see if we can make sure that that's, uh, that's properly defined there. Mm, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, so, so there's, there's also, yeah, the, the concept of alienation. I can see a, a comment in the chat from Douglas Wallace. Um, talking about alienation uh, linked to Marxist theory. Uh, alienation is also, um, is also used in um, you know, contract law type uh, environments as well. Um, so alienation has a, has a whole bunch of different definitions which uh, can be used to distract. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with with people about is it appropriate to use that term in a legal setting and and so on. Mm. Uh, again, I don't think it really matters um, what jargon we use. Um, it's just preferable to not use it. As, I guess as long as the as long as that that term has meaning. And in fact, I would imagine that getting it getting it accepted into the courts and, and getting the courts to recognise that it has a specific meaning would be well, is that something um that amanda that you think that there is that is that a name to try to get the courts to, to not only to recognize it but to, to have an understanding of the definition absolutely i mean there's so much research about it you know there's over a thousand academic articles um associated to parental alienation that are peer-reviewed you know um you're not just going to go oh well let's call it um like dv by proxy you yeah. know let's call it this you know because dv by, by proxy could be using somebody else other than the child you know um using the child as a weapon, obviously it is. But, you know, you've got the people, the likes of Richard Gardner, which calls it, he calls it divorce poison. Mm -hmm. You know, it's poisoning the child's mind against the other parent. You know, I mean, everybody knows that a child's mind can be poisoned against the other parent. But the thing is, like, you know, if you use that term, parental alienation, we, we've heard some parents say that judges have, like, yelled out and said, do not use that term in my courts ever. Oh. You know, and then when they've gone to get transcripts, it's not even, it's been erased out of the transcripts. So unless you actually go in there and listen to it, unless it's been doctored, mm. but you know, usually people are going through so much, it takes so much time to go back and, you know, highlight all these things, especially if they've got the misuse of restraining orders as well, yeah. in conjunction with um, the false claims of everything else. I can see Douglas has put up another... Yes, uh, so um, Douglas has said uh, there is an inevitable extent of distancing between a child and parent in a family split. I know one of the problems some people have in accepting parental alienation is understanding where usual and common issues that children will suffer are to be recognised as parental alienation. How can this be explained easily? Well, I guess so. Um, yeah, looking at the research, looking at the some of the studies that we've done um, and 
looking at the, we've got a collaboration, which is really good in between um, Dr. Jennifer Harmon, um, Dr. Amy Baker and Dr. Mandy Mathewson. And these are three um, researchers that are heavily published in, in this area of parental alienation. And they've sort of come together now and are actually starting to publish um, uh, their work together, which is great. It's good to see that international collaboration and referring to each other's research and things like that. But when you just, I mean, it's just looking at some of these losses, um, I can, I can actually, I've actually got it on our website, which um, let me just quickly bring it up. Yeah, no worries at all. It makes it quite clear, like when you actually, when you actually read, oops, hang on, that's the wrong page. I'll let you, um, let's quickly go down. I had the page open before, but it's not, it wasn't refreshing. Uh, here we go, there it is. So, you know, you've got the corruption of their reality. You've got loss of personal identity, loss of ch childhood and innocence, loss of parental relationship. And then there's a loss of extended family because usually, you know, the alienator will, um, you know, cut them off from the rest of the family, the grandparents, and there's often siblings as well that are left behind if one goes and reunifies. Like in my situation, I had one child that reunified and, and he, was now, he was now the traitor. Um, so he, was, he ended up being alienated from his own sister. Mm. And then you've got the loss of community. So like, you know, everything that's associated to those parents and like often the, the child will be sort of cut off from everything around them. And you can present this in court. You can see like you can show um, like we've got a really good resource, which is resource, which is by COPME, which is children of parents with mental illness. They've got like a template that you can use for a child that has a parent that has a mental illness or a mental disorder. And you can actually show like kind of what happens when say um, mum is not well, like who can the child go to or what happens if um, this person's working or you just go through and you actually look at, you can actually paint a picture of the, the supports in the child's community. And as we know from all the research around the world, connectedness is so important for, um, you know, raising healthy, well-balanced children. You know, you can't have them growing up in an environment having one worldview of one, like a parent. So there's, there's lots of different ways you can kind of present like what's happening to the child um, and how it's impacting them. And often you'll see like that um, black and white thinking, the child will take on that, um, the all good parent, and the all bad parent. And you can see that in, in um, counseling appointments or in communications and SMSs and how the child can be used to bully that parent, you know, and, um, you know, you can see that they're worked up, you know, before their contact and um, you, you can't reason, you can't reason with the child. So there's lots of different ways of presenting this. And there's some, um, I don't want to sound like I'm selling my colleague's book, but she has a great book that um, I'll grab it off the shelf so you can actually see it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Available in all good bookstores. You can actually get it on the National Library in Australia now. You can actually view it for free but that's it there it might be in a different cover I got the hard copy in this one under, under understanding and managing parental alienation a guide to assessment and intervention and there's another really good international book by um, Demosthenes Lorandos and Bill Burnett and that's parental alienation science and law it's it's a thick book it's got so much research uh, sorry so much research in there and evidence-based practice and how to um like present a case and also how to question, like, you know, if you've got someone that says that they're a single expert, you know, it's actually got, if they're on the stand, the questions to actually uh -huh. ask them. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of information because it's really hard. Like if, especially if you, you know, if you've got no money left, which most parents in parental alienation situations that I come across have got no money because it's been in the court for years. Uh -huh. At least you could, you know, you spend whatever it is. I think it's about, I think it was 79 US dollars to buy the ebook. Um, it's obviously a lot more expensive if you get it mailed to Australia or wherever you get it mailed, but it's the best way to sort of get it. But there's so much stuff in that book. Yeah. I, um, I, I noticed Douglas's question was, how can this be explained easily, recognising the difference between the natural distancing uh, that is going to be common and predictable um, and, and what is genuinely parental alienation? I... I, I I think it's a it's a matter of extreme extremes and consistency. If 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 there is no foundation for the 
ideas of the child or the views of the child, no recognised foundation in fact, um, then that would raise suspicions. If there's a polarised view, quite clearly, as Amanda said, this is the good one, this is the bad parent. Um, if, we, if we see that sort of polarisation of views where there's a clear alignment, mm. um, then that, that is a clear warning signal of parental alienation rather than just, I haven't seen dad or mum for, you know, for a couple of days um, and having to adjust to that, yeah. which would be normal. So. There's um, in that um, parental alienation science and law book, there's um, what you call the five factor model. It used to be the four factor model, which was by Dr. Amy Baker, but um, Lorandos and Burnett have um, added to it. So the factor one is the child manifest contact resistance or refusal. So they avoid a relationship with one of the parents. Factor two is the presence of a prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected parent. And the factor three is the absence of abuse, neglect, or seriously deficient parenting on the part of the now rejected parent. And factor four is the use of multiple alienating behaviors on the part of the favored parent, so the alienating parent. And factor five is the child exhibits many of the eight behavioral manifestations of alienation. So uh, that's, that's a great one to go to when you're presenting it. And there's lots of research behind um, that five factor model. And it's in, it's in um, I'm pretty sure it's in Mandy Matheson's book as well. Yeah, it's um, a great way to, um, I guess, you know, presenting. It's really difficult because you're quite limited on how many pages you can put in your affidavit, you know, and, and listing examples, you know. But saying the, those criteria would be useful then for, for assessing it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's another really good book um, by Amy Baker and it sort of has, I think I've still got it, I mm -hmm. present your case. Um, yeah, that, that's it here. This one's really good because it's actually um, the high conflict custody battle. Mm -hmm. Protect yourself and your kids from a toxic divorce, false accusations, and parental alienation. That's by Amy Baker, Michael, uh, J. Michael Bone, and Brian Ludmer. There's actually a section in there that actually shows you how to actually present your case um, as a parent. And then there's um, uh, there was um, what to ask for in court and things like that. If you go and actually look at the index online, you can actually see, and it's got some really helpful resources. Um, I can actually do a post on our page of some of the links on, um, you know, helpful resources or, or email them to you guys to actually put on your website. Yes. They, they are the go-to. And as I say, they are backed by research, um, evidence-based. Yeah. And yes, please do. As I said, we've got Wiki for Men and uh, any info you want to send through. Uh, I, in fact, after the conference, so I've been, especially the last couple of months we've flat out with the conference and things will be sort of waking up a little bit after this and, and uh, something I'd like to touch base with and we'll get a lot more information on our sites. Yeah. So we have a question from Carl. Um, Thank you both for your powerful moving presentation. If I've understood correctly, the definition of PA emphasizes behaviors. Is this because behaviors can be observed? Absolutely, they can be observed. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. oh, there we go. We've got a couple of other some questions. People, some people well. are, right. um, there's also um, some behaviours in the alienating parent that you might not necessarily see sort of going on because it happens at home. It's like those non-verbal communications, like the child's just come back from the other parent's house and they've had a brilliant time and they're really excited to talk about it. And then the, the alienating parent shows that they're just not interested in it or they roll their eyes and you know over time the child learns that that's you know making that parent unhappy and then when you've got all that questioning that goes on with the child um you know like oh we, i'll use the male example like where did he take you and what did he do and like oh was he angry with you and some of these questions will be repeatedly asked like like you know that's so repeatedly asked and um eventually the child will give in and tell that parent what they want to hear and that will often mean lying um because it's um you know children want to be helpful and they don't quite understand why they're why they're getting 
that same question every time and then when they're giving them an answer they're still getting questioned again so there's a study that you can look at that you can refer that you can refer to in family court which is the, the mousetrap study mm -hmm. um, that actually shows you that sort of process of how children will confess um, to things that didn't actually happen Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that I think more broadly, that's uh, certainly the case, isn't it? Where uh, where children try to, if I understand correctly, the children try to please adults, and and there've been a lot of studies in relation to how they give evidence, for example, in court, in relation to that, for precisely the same reason that they would just try to to please adults. Yeah, or there's if there's been suggestive questioning, you know, oh, did Dad hit you, or mm -hmm. did you know, did he, you know forget to feed you or something like that or they ask all these different questions and it's you, we find a lot of people in child protection as well uh, very suggestive because you know sometimes you can find there might be a parent that's working in that field that has maybe a history of abuse themselves or they've had someone really close to them and experience it and instantly they have this perception in their head that they think that that parent's um, abusive because the child's rejecting them but they don't realize that children who are abused usually have a trauma bond to their abuser and they don't necessarily reject their abuser often it's till and until later on when they've sort of you know but still they still naturally love that parent yes you know it's counterintuitive yes yes it is um so james goat has a question uh, i think this is this is an area i haven't heard raised before actually you mentioned issues with identity. Is there any documented relationship between PA and gender dysphoria? That's an interesting question because we're seeing um, we're seeing a lot of problems with like uh, like gender identity um, <coughs> more and more. We're hearing from all around the world that some parents are changing their children's di uh, um, genders and things like that. So it's it's a very delicate subject but it's something that there definitely needs to be more research into it to see what's going on but there are there's a lot of reporting of um all sorts of things in regard to gender and identity formations and things like that i i can talk from my from my own experience being an alienated child um as a as a young girl i was taken from the age of 11 to 18 and that's a really important period of time in your development and because my, my dad used to make comments about my mum um, that, you know, oh, that's something that your mum would do or, oh, gosh, you look so much like your mum today or that's something that your mum would say and all those sort of things, I started to try and look different. And so I started wearing really big black T-shirts that were, you know, like I'd be wearing like a men's large T-shirt and I'm only five foot four, I'm not very big. And so I'd be covering myself up and then I went and dyed my hair like this, weird pink um I don't know it was like a strawberry blonde but I left it in too long because I didn't have any parental supervision so they were calling me strawberry and things like that and so I um had a lot of troubles as a child and even not even feeling feminine yeah. you know not even feeling like and, and I was developing into a woman and I didn't feel feminine like I'd look at people in dresses and I'd think oh yeah that looks nice on them but if I was to put it on myself I would just think oh it looks just really strange like, it was just it felt weird and I've spoken to other alienated children, male and female, who had the same difficulties with forming their identity, you know, and it, that hasn't been until I've actually, like I started wearing dresses for the first time in 2012, right. you know, and that was, you know, this is, you know, and I'm 48 now, you know, so it's a long time to have struggled with that side of it. But people look at me and go, oh, but you look feminine. But it was like, what, what was up in here and what kind yeah. of, you know what happened in my you know those important years and teenage years so um, is, there, is there any um any sort of hard data on that because that's actually i think that is a very interesting area maybe that's something that needs to be looked at oh there is absolutely there's a lot of stuff to do with gender identity and we picked it up in one of our alienated child studies um recently there was one that we did which was on it's very difficult to get alienated children to participate in research because um they don't they don't realize that they've been alienated like myself i didn't realize i'd been mm. alienated until i was an adult and happy to my kids so we only had 10 in that study but in last year's study we had um we had 20 which that data still be um it was a master student who um recently got her marks but everything's passed and now we're going to turn all that data into some articles um and there was just so much like i i i was able to you know be privy to some of this data and honestly it was it was very validating for myself but it was very, it shook me. Like it, it was just, I, yeah, because I've seen it happen, something, some dynamics in my children as well. That, because um, we're all, every, every case is different. It's not a one size fits all. 
So you might have one child that's more of an emotional confident, the other one might be used to emotionally abuse the other parent or there's, you know, some internalise it and some externalise it. So there's so many different factors with that's, um, parental alienation. That's a, that's a really, as I said before, a really, uh, I think, important area and uh, look forward to seeing more data coming out in that area and that's something we'll, uh, we'll look at publicising as well. Yeah, well, there are some studies that have been done by Amy Baker, but they're from quite long ago. And um, even like like with the, ch the targeted parent study that we recently did, they um, wanted to pick out like the top 10 um, like key factors of um, like to contribute to the literature. And they said like um, targeted parents remain limited. Therefore, there is a need for a more worldwide research on the targeted parents perspective. And that's the same with alienated children as well. There's so many different, yeah, dynamics to pick up in outcomes. And we have a question from Douglas Wallace. When I was split apart from my children, I was always careful to keep my own negative emotions hidden. Mm -hmm. However, my children, who are now adults, have told me that even saying to them, don't forget Mother's Day is coming up, or even I still love your mother, had the effect on them to alienate them from their mother, who cheated on me and wasn't uh, being nice about me. Sally touched on this right at the end. My comments for parents on how to avoid this, uh, like my, any comments for parents on how to avoid this kind of issue. Absolutely. It's a difficult thing. I, I remember when I first got my children back, um, like my, my son was the first one that came back after four and a half years and my daughter was, it was um, seven and a half, just almost eight years. And when, when I got them back, like I was always saying like positive things, but then you could see how they're just so hyper protective and they can't talk about the other parent or share anything um, because of all this manipulation going on. And yeah, it's a real struggle for the kids because they feel guilty. Um, they've participated in the alienation um, and they've rejected you. And um, it's, it's like when their world has been full of like emotional input they lose that ability to use critical thinking. Mm. And so like they might think that because one parent's saying, oh, I'll use for Douglas example, dad always talks bad about, about me and he's um, emotionally abusive or he's this, like, and they can say multiple things. Mm. And yet when they're with their dad, they might not necessarily steal it, but because they've been programmed, they believe that. Mm. And then when that parent, you know, says anything about the other parent, it's like all of a sudden the anxiety goes up, the critical thinking shut down. They don't think about, um, that's what's so disturbing about this form of abuse. It really messes with their thinking so that they don't see if there's, there could be more evidence. Is there another side to this? Um, what happens if I, if I had taken a different view to this comment that's been made or, you know, it's just, they're just shut down. And it's like that they take on that parent's thinking and feeling as if it's their own, thoughts and feelings you know it's um so is it is it better for one parent to to, to not mention the other then in, at least in that regard yeah well it's sort of avoiding that especially in like that first two years of a reunification oh. is focusing on like your own environment but also encouraging critical thinking in other areas yeah. like you'll see these sort of dynamics will play out in their own relationships they'll often compromise themselves or they might become a bully to other people you know, you get a child that might become an alienator. You right. get, get might, one might become the pleaser, you mm. know, where both of mine come out as being pleasers. They mm. compromise themselves and things like that. So you could sort of say, uh, you could teach them like healthy boundaries and things like that instead. Mm. Or have, um, there's a couple of games that you can actually use, which encourages critical thinking. Mm. Um, I always recommend it's a good idea to have a, um, an independent sort of therapist who can actually work with the kids on these specific um things because it's hard when it's the parent because you've got you know one parent saying one thing one saying the other but if you've got a, a therapist independently you know teaching mm -hmm. you know some helpful tools how to deal with their situation then that works better some of the books actually refer to the types of therapies that are required like normal traditional therapy just does not work mm -hmm. um, while you've got the child still in the care of the alienating parent if anything, it actually makes it worse. We actually shared an article uh, a couple of days ago about that, that it just does not work. So you mentioned a couple of... Sorry, go on. Uh, so so I'm, I'm just reading Douglas's question. So saying something like, don't forget about Mother's Day is coming up or I still love your mother. 
Um, I'm, it, it sounds like Douglas is the targeted parent and, and trying to, you know, try, trying to be reasonable. Uh, but it, it just seems to be a lose lose situation. Um, for the you don't. Parent. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> yeah, um, that any mention of the other parent will raise anxiety, particularly if the other parent is is the alienating parent. Um, so it will just remind the child that they're actually in a battle zone, and even the even bringing up the thought of the other parent will re-trigger a whole bunch of trauma and. Mm -hmm what internal obligations they feel to either spy or um, perceive the world through through the lens that um, the alienating parent wants them to see the world through. Mm. Um, to, so I, I really emphasise with Douglas saying, you know, well, what are you going to say? You, you can try to... You can try not to deliberately bring up unnecessarily issues about the other parent and focus on the here and now. But um, it, I, I know, having tried to, to walk that line myself, that it, it's just impossible. You, you, can't, you can't have every topic pretending that there's only one parent. Yeah. Um, that, that's abuse in a different direction. So. <laughs> Absolutely. It's sort of, it depends on the scale of the alienation as well. Like it depends yeah. on, um, and whether you've had like no contact at all kind of thing. Like if you've had no contact at all, it's always sort of like focusing forward and, um, you know, um, learning to communicate with your child. Like so often people miss out on many years of contact with their kids and they lose touch of where the child's at on the kind of a conversational level. So it's good to get online and actually I've put a couple of them on my website of different articles which are helpful to engage with the, um, with the children. There's one in particular um, that, I, that I found very helpful. Um, it's, quite, it's got quite a, quite a funny, funny name to the book. I'll just quickly grab it up because it's not coming to my, the top of my head. It's, like, can, it's something like, can you take me to the, here, here it is, um, Alison's. Yeah, it's, it says, get out of my life, but first, could you drive me and Cheryl to the mall? A parent's guide to the new teenager. That's a very helpful book because, you know, when you're dealing with adolescence, that's like a whole other thing in itself. But then when you add the mix of parental alienation as well, it's good to have these resources to sort of go to and sort of know what's the teenage kind of behaviour and what's um, parental alienation behaviour. But, you know, I, I found that I had to avoid saying anything about, um, you know, the other parent at all in my first couple of months with the kids because I could just see straight away they get anxious and, and not want to talk about it. But then now, like, we're, um, you know, I'm years out of it with my son and I'm, I'm sort of two years out of it with my daughter. And that almost, no, she misses, um, uh, yeah, this is the second Christmas now um there's still some things that she's still protected but I can still mention things now like you know about the dad you know you know because they're moving into state and things like that so I just sort of try to encourage you make sure you spend more time with them before they leave and you know try not to plan too much with all your friends you know through this Christmas break if they're leaving in a couple of weeks and stuff like that and you know she can actually yeah because her anxiety is being dealt with as well it's sort of um it has helped um, with having these sort of conversations but as I say it's not it's it's not a one-size-fits-all you've kind of got to monitor like you know if you did bring up a, a subject that was touchy to see how they respond and it's like damned if you do damned if you don't in in parental alienation it's so hard I um, I've in the last week I've actually had a discussion with a psychologist about about this particular topic which is how how do you walk the line um, as an alienated parent to not engage in the same destructive behavior but also try to maintain a relationship when there's very little to hang a relationship on mm. um, so so things like oh so what have you been doing at school um, can easily i mean on one hand you can say oh you're probing into their life on the other hand, well, what else are you going yeah. to talk about? And that specifically is an alienating tactic is with, to withhold information about their schooling from you. And exactly. they usually know that they're not allowed to share anything with you. 
exactly. Yeah. Um, and to, so, so in the past couple of weeks, I I said, oh, okay, so you've moved house. All oh, right, okay. Are you still in the same suburb? No, no, not allowed to say that. So that's a big secret because somehow. Um, my, my son is now not allowed to tell me where he lives, presumably because I'm a horrible, violent person. Stalker, and, you know. You know. But yeah, stalker and my, it, completely without any mm. uh, any court requirement for that. It's just, no, nah, we've moved and we don't want to tell you and it's a secret, don't tell your dad. Um, so walking that line of asking, um, asking questions to know about their life, to find information, to actually be able to engage and have a discussion Mm. um that's on one side on the other side yeah there is probing and trying to get information um and shifting the topic onto you know these are all the ways that your other parent is terrible mm. um obviously that's that's engaging in alienating behavior um which isn't justified by anybody that's but walking that line is tricky yeah, well, that's why it's good to be familiar with the alienating um, tactics and behaviours and things like that is sort of trying to avoid those topics where they're going to um, yeah. disconnect completely because that's why children cut off is because it just gets too difficult and they've got their emotional bar of one parent up here and they're always trying to please them, yeah. you know, and, and cutting off that parent completely um, reduces that pressure on them. Yep. You know, and a lot of people just don't understand that, unfortunately, and that's why some of the therapists that get involved um, don't know how to coach parents or to um, um, provide the right therapies for children. You know, so you know, I would sort of um, suggest sort of things like, um, you know, trying to find like, you know, what are their interests and things like that, or what do they like doing, or um, you know, what have they got? Have they got something planned for the upcoming break, or? Or give them little updates about what you've been up to and things like that. Or bring up something, oh, yeah, I was thinking the other day about, like, you know, talk about a memory, you know. Or, oh, do you want me to send through, through that photo? I still have that photo. Or just little things like that, you know. Um, yeah. But sometimes you might get accused then of living in the past. So that's why I say it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> it's it's hard. It's really hard. And until we get um, interventions from, like, child protection or the police or the courts, we have to kind of almost muddle our way through these sort of situations, you know, and sort of like reading books like Divorce Poison by Dr. Warshak, that's got some tips in there. We've got some tips on our website um, uh, on the parental alienation page. There's a one download actually on there, which is really helpful. I'm going to grab the name of it really fast. It's got some great tips. Actually, what I'll do is I'll get through, I'll copy a, a document of everything that I think that are helpful um, in regard to um, alienation situations. Um, this one's called Beyond the High Road, Responding to 17 Parental Alienation Strategies Without Compromising Your Morals or Harming Your Child. And they're actually oh, really- I want, I, want a, I want that, I need that. Yeah, and it is, it's, it's available. Like it didn't used to, used to have to pay, it used to be a paywall for it, but we've actually got permission. We've actually got it on our website now on the parents page. It's halfway down the page under communicating with the other parent, but it sort of, um, yeah, it sort of lists a few things under there. It's hard because sometimes you might list like a whole bunch of things and what we've learned through our web, through our social media is that you'll get a lot of people commenting, but you won't get a lot of click-throughs mm -hmm. because people are in crisis. And so you kind of have to provide, instead of articles, it's providing list circles. So you've got mm -hmm. like little lists, like little bite-sized chunks for people to be able to just go, oh, yeah, that's, I got that, I got that. But if you have a certain subject line, next thing you know, it triggers them and you get people typing about their experiences and, and you'll get so much information on a comment that will be as much as what you'll find probably in an affidavit. And that's, that's a good sign that some, not a good sign, it's a, it's a sign that someone is experiencing trauma and it can look unbalanced. It can look like someone's unhinged online. And, you know, that's what the big thing that I found was when I, when I stepped into this space and started working with um, parents, at first I could have easily gone and just go, oh, God, there's something wrong with him, he's or her or whatever, and just think, oh, he's probably got like a mental disorder or something, you know, thinking the way they were behaving was just so, you know, odd and aggressive-like. But now that I understand what trauma does to people and that can drive you into some deep 
dark places. And then when you've got the misuse of restraining orders, you've got all these allegations that get made. You've got so many parents out there that are in absolute crisis, yet there is no support from the courts or child protection at the moment. And they can see why I'm, I'm so passionate about getting this recognised because it's just, yeah, as I said, like I think I mentioned, we, our suicide rate was 23% of the targeted parents had attempted suicide at least once in, their, in one of our latest studies. And that's, that's huge. That's a big amount. It's, it's amazing that despite the over, what I would consider to be overwhelming evidence, we actually have, in our case in Australia, representatives in the government, as you've pointed out, denying it's, it, it happens. You've got courts denying it. It's ex absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, so it's not just the denial of it, it's the misrepresentation on social media. Yep. You've got these extreme feminists that are saying that um, parental alienation is what abusive fathers claim to take children away from protective mothers. And uh, well, the, the, the judge in my, in my case actually said before looking at the evidence, before hearing the testimony of experts, one of whom was Amanda, mm. <laughs> Uh, said, this is not a parental alienation case. Well, the judge couldn't know that. Yes, before the evidence <laughs> was offered, how would the judge possibly know such a thing? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. And, and if you ask them to define what parental alienation is and what all the behave, you know, alienating tactics and all that kind of stuff, yeah. They'll probably well, it doesn't matter. Right. Whatever it is, yeah. it's not that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we're starting to come up on our uh, on our hard deadline. We have a, a hard deadline of forty eight minutes, and I usually aim to wrap up around forty five. But we do have a couple of extra a couple of questions that have come in. Carl asks: Are there any resources for therapists working either with the parents or children in relation to PA? Absolutely. Those are two books that I mentioned, which was the one was the um, Understanding and Managing Parental Alienation, and there's actually another one. There's actually a new one by um, uh, Amy Baker. Uh, let me grab that. It's a uh, when you actually look at it, sort of where is it? I think parental alienation books. I think this redirects to Amazon. Actually, I do have it. Yes, I do have it. Oh, good. I've got so many books here. <laughs> I wasn't actually pull it from that bookshelf. I've got a little bookshelf, but this one's called Restoring Family Connections. Oops. I'll just be there for a moment. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and that one's by that one's by um, Amy Baker and Paul Fine, F I N E, and Aliana Baker, Lachine Baker. Yeah, so that's another really good resource for therapists. But in the two books that I've mentioned in the beginning, which was that Parental Alienation Science and Law, that talks about therapy, and so does um, Understanding and Managing Parental Alienation: A Guide to Assessment and Intervention. They both, yeah. Um, I can, I can post some so I can post some information on the Hoover website too. Um, if, you, if you want to send some stuff stuff through to me, Amanda, I'll post yeah. it on the Hoover website. We've got one last question. Alienating children don't know how to respond when a parent makes contact. Like you said during open discussion, it's true. That is true. The other way around too. I've talked to parents who are feeling so hurt at the years of distance that the emotional risk when a child makes contact seems massive. Not spoke of this the need to pull back to some extent just to protect oneself, how to avoid this echoing alienation. I, I've often said um, your pain can become their pain. And so it's really important that parents do educate about the child's actual experience, that it's not their fault, that they do have high anxiety, um, that their thinking can, can be you know, distorted. And um, you know, it's important not to be like reactive, um, not to push your side of the story um uh, focus on the child um even though like you've got your own feelings and you, and you know in some situations the child's been worked up to be like abusive towards you um there's a, there's a really good term that uh dr Wal dr walshack mentions in, in his book and it, it said strike when the iron is cold and you know often with metal it's more pliable and you can work with it, but with alienation situations, um, you don't want the child to be heated. So if you've got a child that's contacting you and they're worked up and they're, um, you know, uh, it's best not to actually um, speak at that time, try and find another time to communicate. And, you know, you can say things like, you know, I'm sorry that you're feeling that way, or I don't remember that being that way. Um, 
Um, and so try to avoid those sort of subjects. But if they're heated, you're just not going to raise them with them, especially if they've got an alienating parent standing over them or someone who's actually doing that SMSing, contacting, because I found that that's what was actually happening in my situation because I happened to keep all the SMS records and um, one of my kids decided that they wanted to see it. And I was like, oh, I didn't want them to go through all that, but they wanted to see, they wanted validation of what the actually other parent was actually doing um, in this situation because I've never pushed all this court stuff under the kids' noses. I've always tried to move them into self-care to get them back on track in their lives. Um, but, yeah, eventually some of these kids do get that curiosity, but you don't, you don't want to open up those floodgates, <laughs> you know, and overwhelm the child because that's going to have, that your pain becomes their pain. You know, so some of the things you have to sort of, well, I, don't, I don't know if I answered that appropriately, but you've just got to, yeah, there's ways of managing contact with the kids. Um, yeah, I, I um, it was responding to Douglas, it's, uh, you know, I found this particularly challenging myself, um, that my emotional pain of making contact with the children um is so great that I tend to avoid making contact, which then results in them feeling abandoned and unloved, which then feeds back into me feeling abandoned and unloved, which, <laughs> mm -hmm. so it, it's really, really difficult for me to, to know how to do that. It, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a two way feedback loop. Mm -hmm. um, and it's yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking for. I, I guess I could ask exactly the same question Douglas asked, uh, which is, yeah, how do we fix this? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> there's. Um, I, I'm just trying to. I'm just going to find that quick metaphor that I I created out of the textbook by Amy Baker, and it was messages of love, um, because from what we know from the research, when parents just completely withdraw and don't make any more contact because they think oh well, my children don't love me or they're angry at me or whatever it is the children that have been able to come through and actually participate in the study wish that their alien alienated or the targeted parent did not give up um, did not walk away but still tried um, and so what we, we're teaching is um this is a really it's probably a good one to end this one on is this I'm, I'm actually gonna have to jump in where we're right out of time so you have a really quick really quick comment Really it's just a little paragraph. It's just a little paragraph. Go on. Go on. Think of your messages like watering a plant. When we plant a seed in the ground, we cannot see what is happening beneath the earth, but we water the soil anyway. The watering is an act of hope and faith that one day a flower will bloom. Your relationship with your child is like that flower. It needs attention and care every day so that one day, perhaps when you least expect it, the flower will bloom and your child will respond to you with the openness of love. I think that is a fantastic place to finish. Mm. Thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you.